Good afternoon. Welcome to our webcast on diversity, pay, progression and gender. My name is Rima Ahmed from the Chartered Banker Institute and today I'm delighted to introduce Hilary Cooper, Associate Director from the Finance Foundation. After a short period as a banking intern at the start of her career, Hilary joined the civil service working for more than 20 years as a government economist and senior policy maker, also acting as an advisor and trustee for the youth charity Theatre Is from 2008 to 2012. After leaving to begin her freelance career, she published Putting Customers First, a report on retail finance and regu finance regulation for Demos Finance in 2014, followed in 2016 by a major report for the Finance Foundation titled When I'm 84, Locking the Door on the Older Old, the challenge facing Britain's banks, which looked at financial exclusion in older age. Both reports can be found in today's attachments tab of the webcast. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the online function to submit these, and Hilly will try her best to answer as many as possible at the end. I hope you enjoyed today's webcast, and I'll now hand you over to Hilary. Okay, good afternoon, um, and thanks very much for that introduction. Um, as Remus uh, just said, I'm going to be talking today um, about the research I did um, with the Chartered Banker Institute last November. Um, it's actually quite possible that some of you may even have taken part in that research because it was based on a questionnaire that was sent out to members um, in which we asked for your views on a range of issues um, covering issues around progression, diversity, and pay. So. Um, the, the format uh, for my presentation before I take questions um, at the end will be along the lines set out here. Um, firstly, I'll give you some quick background on the Finance Foundation, which is the organization that I work for, and uh, then explain the thinking behind the work that um, we did with the Institute. To set that in context, I'll present some data and some thoughts on why we have a gender pay gap and why it persists. Then I'll move on to give you a summary of the key findings from the member survey before um, drawing it all together to offer some conclusions and some reflections on next steps. So the Finance Foundation is an independent think tank specifically focused on financial services with an overarching remit um, to encourage debate about the sector, explain what the sector does, and help in thinking about ways it could work more effectively. Um, we do this uh, by running a regular series of thought leadership events uh, where we seek to promote this debate. Um, and we also carry out in-depth research. Um, and Rima's mentioned a couple of um, the research projects. Um, and that's done to influence stakeholders and policymakers. Um, and all of that is explained in more detail on our website. The, the um, website address is there, and it's also in the attachment and links section. Um, just very quickly, I'll connect up some faces and names. So this slide shows our director, Andrew Freeman. He's had a diverse career in, in the sector, having started out as a financial journalist. And then myself, um, my background, as, as you've heard, is primarily in public policy, firstly as a government economist, um, where I specialized in labor market economics at the beginning of my career. Then I moved into senior policy-making roles. Um, and latterly, I had a period as an operational director for HR and finance. Um, again, there's more detail on our website about all of our associates and people who work for us um, and much more information on our research reports um, should you wish to follow any of that up. So now moving on to the survey and the survey objectives. The Chartered Banker Institute was concerned to look at career progression in banking and to understand any barriers affecting progression, um, particularly looking at barriers that might affect women especially. There had been a previous survey carried out by YouGov in May 2016, and in that survey, members had thrown up a number of issues, including um, issues around company culture, issues around flexible working, and in particular, a, a, a very strong view coming from both men and women that there was not a level playing field um, when it came to promotion. Um, so the 2017 survey was commissioned uh, to revisit these issues and also to um, extend the scope of the survey to include pay negotiation and pay transparency, um, including gathering views on whether and why gender pay inequalities might persist for what are apparently similar jobs. 
Now, I said that I would give some context, um, wider context to all of this work to understand um, where it's all coming from. So clearly the whole issue of gender diversity and the experience of men and women in the workplace is very much in the news at the moment. Um, There remain concerns about the low representation of women in senior roles across all sectors and obviously also, of course, in financial services and the existence of the the so-called glass ceiling. Um, And there's also an increased focus around the persistence of uh, gender pay gaps. And I've just given you a a definition here of the gender pay gap, which is the difference in the average or more, more often the median earnings of men and women in the sum total of all jobs across the economy. So it's not about specific jobs, it's the, it's the overall average gap between men and women. And that currently stands at nearly 20% in favour of men. Um, many of you may also be aware of the work led by Jane and Guardia of Virgin Money, um, which looked at the, the first of the issues um, that I raised, which is female representation in senior roles in financial services. Um, and the data in, in the report she published showed that just one in seven members of executive boards um, in the sector are women. Um, And that research, which was published in 2016, led to the launch um, by government of the Women in Finance Charter. um, And signatories to that charter are now, now, um, I think, covering around half of the sector. Those signatories agree to set targets for gender diversity in their senior roles and to hold their senior executives to account for progress against those targets. Um, You'll also um, certainly be aware of the requirement um, covering the issue of gender pay gaps, requirement for organizations with more than 250 employees to publish data on their gender pay gap. That came into effect last month, covering uh, pay in April 2017. And that requirement was more extensive, in fact, than, than the gender pay gap. It covered issues like the percentage of men and women in each quartile of the earnings distribution. So there's a lot, lot of information just been published there. Um, the results were not surprising. Um, so of the 10,000 plus firms that reported as part of that exercise, Um, In 78% of cases, men's median pay exceeded women's. In 14% of cases, it was the other way around, and women's median pay was higher, and 8% reported no difference. Um, And, of course, as as we already knew from other data, financial services doesn't perform well. They were the second worst performing sector after construction, um, according to the first analysis of, of, of that reporting exercise. So all of this has led to calls for more action to be taken to address the causes of both the gender pay gap and the dearth of women in senior positions. Um, And there's been a lot of political um, attention in what is obviously the centenary year of women's first suffrage. Um, And with that has come pressure from senior politicians such as Nikki Morgan, who chairs the Treasury Select Committee and has been very proactive on gender pay gaps. Theresa May herself has has made a number of um, statements on it. And it's being overseen by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And they've recently announced that they will be looking to take action against the 1,500 firms. Um, That's not financial services firms, that's across the economy. 1,500 firms who should have reported their gender pay gap have not reported. So that's the kind of um, current context. Uh, Now I thought I'd give you some data um, to just flesh out what we actually know about gender pay gaps. Um, This slide is based on, not on the gender pay gap reporting exercise, but on the Office for National Statistics annual survey of hours and earnings. Um, And uh, that can give us data going back for the last 20 years. And in this slide, you can see the whole economy, which is the lower blue line, and then the information for financial services, gender pay gap, which is the higher line, the red line. Um, So a number of interesting things that that this chart tells us. Um, First of all, it shows us that the current gap between uh, medium hourly earnings for men and women is 18.4% across the whole economy, and that covers um, hourly earnings for full and part-time workers. Um, But the uh, equivalent pay gap is nearly double for financial services at 35.6%, so you can clearly see that substantial gap. 
both of those figures um, you might notice are quite a lot higher than the figures that have just been reported in the gender pay gap reporting exercise done by employers. Um, that's okay. That's probably because only large organizations with over 250 employees were included in that exercise. So it isn't um, the picture for the whole economy. Um, clearly, those employers are um, reporting a lower overall gender pay gap. It's also perfectly possible that the 1,500 who haven't reported yet will have higher pay gaps than the average will come up once they do report. Um, so coming back to this chart, it's also interesting to look at what's happened over the last 20 years. Um, some good news, the gap has reduced. Um, so for the blue line for the whole economy, it's reduced by about a third since 1997. Um, when it stood at 27%. Um, obviously, that means it's, if it carries on at that rate, it's going to take rather a long time to um, close the gap completely. Um, and if you look at the red line, the top line, um, there's also been a decline in, in, the, in the gender pay gap in financial services. That was quite slow and a bit up and down until three or four years ago, um, but then it really seemed to pick up pace and started coming down um, more steeply than the, than the overall average. Um, so if that trend continues and the financial services pay gap continues to reduce faster than the average, then we might actually see the financial services sector coming more into line with the whole economy picture over the next few years. And I think that's something that uh, commentators, particularly in, in the financial services, are going to be looking at closely um, to, to see if that happens and to understand uh, what's driving that. Okay. Um, so now I'm just going to um, explore a little why the reasons why gender pay gaps um, persist. Um, and I just want to reiterate, the gender pay gap, as it's talked about in, in, in the press and, and academia, is not primarily about men and women being paid differently in the same job, although that can, of course, happen. But the key issue um, around gender pay gaps is that women, on average, tend to be in the types of jobs that are paid less, and men, on average, tend to be in higher paying jobs or occupations. Um, and that, that creates a structural inequality in our society, in our e economy, and it's that structural inequality that is what explains um, the persistence of gender pay gaps. Um, so on this slide, um, I hope you can read it, there's a wheel diagram that the Chartered Institute for Professional Development um, has produced, which um, gives some more detail and just um, identifies a set of key drivers of, of, of the gender pay gap, of why we have this um, inbuilt inequality. So um, starting at 2 o'clock, um, Undoubtedly, in the past, differences in human capital, which refers to um, education and training, so access to education and training beyond basic levels, certainly in the past, affected women's earning potential relative to men. Um, and so also did wholesale occupational segregation of women. Historically, uh, women were clustered into lower paid, predominantly service sector jobs, whereas men tended to be in rather more higher paying jobs, um, things like skilled manufacturing roles or professions. So that um, occupational uh, segregation embedded gender pay gaps. Now, um, until the 1970s, pay discrimination, one, one of the boxes on this wheel, um, was not actually illegal. Um, so that was obviously a factor. Um, after the passing of the Equal Pay and the Sex Discrimination legislation in the early part of that decade, um, very interestingly, there was a very rapid narrowing, I think probably one of the fastest narrowing that, that we've ever seen of gender pay gaps. So that clearly suggests that um, prior to that, there was significant um, discrimination, which would have affected not just the pay that, that women received, that the likelihood of their getting equal pay to men in the jobs that, that they took, but also quite significant discrimination over the types of jobs that, that women could access. So a whole set of better paying jobs um, may not have been available. Um, it's also true that this period, the 60s, 70s, um, and, and, and the period around that, saw very significant changes in the expectations and the opportunities for girls and women. And that clearly um, 
acted at the same time as the pay discrimination legislation to help um, further narrow gender pay gap gaps as um, girls' educational levels increased and the occupations open to them and the aspirations that they had to enter those occupations broadened. Um, and we've come a long way. We've now reached the point where more women graduate from university than men. Um, so the, these differences in human capital are, are, are certainly uh, well eroded, but it's still the case um, that women are very much underrepresented in more highly paying subjects such as the STEM subjects at university. So um, while uh, a lot of progress has been made, there are still forces that keep the gender pay gap uh, alive. Um, that will also include um, one, one of the other boxes on this wheel, the undervaluing of jobs that are typically done by women. Um, and increasingly, those issues are being tackled through equal value claims, equal pay for roles of equal value. But attention now on the gender pay gap is in increasingly being focused on the top box, the one I haven't mentioned yet, um, as being the hardest to shift, um, part-time working and caring responsibilities. It's now very well documented that these responsibilities and, and, and the tendency to work part-time because of caring responsibilities for children and increasingly for older relatives now accounts for a lot of the remaining gender pay gap. And, it, and that's because it affects people's career progression, women's career pro progression, it affects their pay progression, and it almost certainly affects the types of jobs and the types of industries that women choose to go into um, at that point in their lives. Um, and what's very interesting, actually, is something that really um, brings that home is um, the Resolution Foundation has published um, data looking at the gender pay gap for different generations of people. And if you look at the gender pay gap of millennials, and, and that's um, sort of roughly people born from the early 1980s up to, the, to about 2000, they appear to be the first generation um, that we've got data for where what, men and women don't experience a gender pay gap until they reach their late 20s and early 30s. And that, of course, is the point at which caring responsibilities start to become a, a significant factor in pay and progression. Um, and at that point, um, you can start to see the divergence in pay between men and women emerging. So again, that, that um, backs up the, the importance of that. So I hope that's given you some helpful contact, context as to, to what, what we're looking at and, and um, what the issues are. Before we go on to look at the survey that, that was done for the Chartered Banker Institute and, and how that relates to all of this analysis, I just wanted to highlight um, what a couple of, of banks have been saying publicly about all of these issues, um, particularly in the wake of the gender pay reporting requirement. Now, Virgin Money um, were one of the first to report their median pay gap several months ago, um, and at 32.5%, that's that's the that is high, but it's not that untypical for financial services. Um, and although um, they have an exemplary board, um, the only all-female chair and chief executive team, they still overall put their gender pay gap down to a lack of women in senior roles and um, the other side of the coin to a lack of men or a predominance of women in more junior roles. Um, TSB um, also had very similar issues. Um, so they took this analysis further by looking at what would happen if they didn't have a gender segregation across their senior and junior roles. And they calculated that while they had an actual pay gap of 31%, um, that would reduce to 8% if their posts below senior management were filled equally by men and women, and that it would reduce to 1% if men and women were also equally represented in um, senior posts. Um, so if, if that analysis is correct, it's clear that tackling the reasons for women remaining concentrated in more junior roles and supporting their progression to the higher levels or the top level of their organization has got to be the most important thing needed to address um, gender inequality and the, and the average pay disparity. And um, arguably, therefore, that's at least as important, maybe more important, as securing pay parity once uh, men and women are performing in the same roles. Okay. So 
Um, all of these issues form the context of the survey we carried out last November and December for the Institute, um, which was looking at uh, members' views on all of these things, progression opportunities, barriers to progression, um, talent retention, and how pay and pay rises are agreed. And this slide just shows you some of the key data on, on the people who responded to that survey. So we received um, just over 500 responses um, to the online questionnaire. Um, and uh, the gender balance uh, that, that, that uh, we recorded in respondents, 51% uh, women, 48% men, 1% preferred not to say, very closely mirrored that of the overall membership of the Institute. So that was helpful. 9% um, overall said that they worked part-time, although that split 15% of women working part-time and 3% of men working part-time, not unexpected. Um, there was an interesting spread of experience within banking, uh, more than a third having been in the sector for over 20 years, um, another 20% having worked in the sector for between 11 and 20, and then um, at, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, a significant chunk, 22% who'd worked in banking for three years or less. Um, the next bullet gives you the, the distribution um, in types of role, 10% senior executives or managers, 41% middle or junior, and 48% without management responsibility. So although 10% were senior executives or senior managers, men were actually three times more likely to be in this category, with 16% of men being senior managers compared with 5.5% of women. Again, not unexpected. So coming on to the actual results from the survey, the first set of questions asked for people's views on progression opportunities within um, the sector. And people were in general pretty positive about the general climate, three quarters um, saying that there were good opportunities for progression. And then in this uh, right-hand pie chart, even higher numbers um, saying that women had good opportunities for progression. But this a uh, positive view um, is slightly tempered when people are asked about barriers within their own organization, barriers to progression in, the, in, in their own organization, with more than half of both men and women at that point saying that there are barriers impeding progression, and also a view that barriers became more visible as you progress on in your career. So looking at what barriers uh, people highlighted, um, there was a very strong perception, and this was raised by a third of respondents, both um, equally men and women, uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, this repeated um, a finding in 2016 that promotion is determined by who you know um, and not entirely on merit. Um, other, a lot, lot of other barriers were raised. Many cited organizational barriers, um, saying that there was a lack of opportunities or perhaps insufficient senior roles in their particular location. Um, and um, other organizational barriers included uh, business uncertainty um, or recruitment freezes that, that were affecting progression. Around a fifth of respondents thought that family and personal commitments and a lack of opportunities to work flexibly were a break on progression. Um, and unsurprisingly, that was mentioned more often by women. 20% of women said that against 15% of men. Some saw personal characteristics um, as a barrier to progression. Um, people mentioning gender, age, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, or religious belief in, in different uh, amounts. Um, and many also saw the need for more support for development uh, with, their, with their career pr progression or thought that lack of confidence or lack of role models um, w was holding them back. So this theme of uh, support for development, um, especially in areas like coaching and professional development and mentoring, was repeated later in the survey. Um, that when many respondents told us that despite being pretty clear that they, they thought their organization had a high performance culture, they also at the same time felt there was insufficient attention in their organization to talent retention and, and talent development, um, and that they were dissatisfied with the opportunities that they had for promotion. We did a bit more delving of this whole area of progression and people's attitudes to promotion and progression. 
um, asking people if they were put off seeking promotion by the burden of responsibility in senior roles um, or by family constraints. And in fact, fewer than 5% of both men and women said that they were not looking for progression. So clearly, um, it's not that people don't want progression. Um, and what, what they told us is that if they needed, if there needed to be negotiation and compromise um, in couples uh, due to their family constraints, their family responsibilities, they told us that those decisions were generally taken jointly with the aim of minimising um, the impact that their responsibilities had on both careers, or at least if they weren't able to do that, at least um, they, they were concerned um, and motivated to share the burden. So if we take that at face value, it suggests that where family commitments are preventing progression, that must be due to logistical constraints or to lack of flexibility and not due to a disinclination um, that people might have to seek promotion. Um, respondents were clear that they wanted the Institute to support um, career development and cited a number of activities that would help um, in progression and help in improving gender diversity in more senior roles. They saw um, many benefits flowing from improved gender diversity, not just for their own individual career opportunities, but also organizational performance, and perhaps particularly pertinent at the moment, company image, um, the, the image to potential recruits, and image to external clients and customers, um, which I think is something that's on a lot of organizational organizations minds as they navigate through this gender pay reporting and what, what that says about their their company um, so all of those were, were very interesting responses now the final section of our survey moved on from progression and diversity to look directly at the issue of pay um, looking at how pay is determined um, and how much uh, transparency there is in that process or how much transparency there's perceived to be in that process so when asked about how pay is determined, about 7 in 10 said that the pay or the pay range for their job was clearly defined, although there might be some room for, for discretion or discussion within that. But 23% said that there was no clear information on what they should be paid and that this was almost entirely a matter of individual negotiation. A similar picture um, emerged for pay progression two-thirds saying that their pay rises were linked to a, a structured appraisal system so that they could know what they would likely get if they performed to a particular level. Um, and the remainder citing uh, various deg degrees of negotiation or discretion, 17% saying there was some link but quite a lot of scope for negotiation, and 8% saying pay awards were, were basically discretionary. So given that there does seem to be this latitude around both pay and um, pay rises, um, allowing for individual negotiation, it's highly relevant to ask how much people know about what other people are paid. And um, that was an, a question we included in the survey. Um, we asked about the level of pay transparency, um, by which we uh, mean how easy it is to access information about what others are earning in similar jobs and about how pay and pay rises are determined in those jobs. And we covered pay and bonuses in those questions. So as these two pie charts at the bottom of the slide show, 45% of those replying thought that there was a high level of transparency about what others were earning, but 32% said that there was a low level of transparency. Um, interestingly, again, not necessarily surprisingly, far fewer, 26%, thought that there was a good level of transparency um, in relation to bonus payments, but 46% thought that transparency around bonuses was low. So um, given that there is que clearly a lot of individual negotiation going on around pay and around pay rises and, and a fairly incomplete picture available to people about what others are earning, there's clearly some scope for people doing similar jobs and performing to um, the same standard. Uh, to be being paid different amounts. And we asked people whether they thought that actually was the case, whether they thought there might be some sort of gender pay inequality um, in how people are paid in similar roles. And in response to that question, 78% of men said that they were confident that men and women doing the same job at the same standard would receive the same pay. Only 57% of women thought that. So overall, 67% thought that, but quite a significant difference between men and women. 
And the chart in this slide um, gives the reasons people thought men and women might end up getting paid differently in the same job. Obviously, these are just opinions. They're not, uh, we don't know if they're actually the case, but this is what people responding said that they thought might be the drivers. And it's important to um, just reiterate that the most significant response here is the bar for the 37% uh, who said that they didn't think that in any circumstances that would happen for pay or for bonuses. Um, but the other two highly significant factors mentioned um, were firstly coming back to this issue of pay transparency, that a lack of pay transparency means that um, women don't have the information to know what they should be asking for when they have to negotiate pay. And clearly there's a view that that's more of a... Um, a barrier for women than for men, that men perhaps don't rely on that information as much, but that, that women are, are, are just not realizing how much they could be bargaining for. Um, and secondly, that family commitments um, make it harder to negotiate forcefully on pay, um, because if what you really want is um, concessions on flexibility and uh, work-life balance, maybe you don't go in and, and push as hard on pay. Um, there were many other factors mentioned. Um, people mentioned a lack of female role models. Um, people mentioned women's own approach to negotiating pay, that perhaps they were just less likely to push forcibly um, or that they were less likely to use um, tactics such as saying that they had applied for or that they were going to apply for other jobs and using that as a, as a bargaining um, strategy. Um, and also um, some feeling that organizations were less um, favorable to women pushing harder for pay than, than, than they were when men pushed for, for, for higher pay. Um, so those are, those are sort of softer factors um, that, that people raised. And really interestingly, they were much, much more often cited by women than by men, um, although there's a question about why women might be paid less um, it was, it was uh, these softer cultural things were, were very much at the forefront of women's minds and not so much perceived um, by men. Okay, so that's um, a brief overview of the key findings. Um, there's more uh, detail in the, in the report that's going to be published. There's a publication coming out in a, in a week or so um, giving the full results from the survey, and I'm sure that you will um, be told how to access that um, in due course. So um, coming on to the next slide, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to um, draw it all together and reflect on uh, where all of the, these survey find, findings leave us when thinking about pay and progression. And in particular, um, I'm, I want to draw on what the respondents in the survey themselves said that they thought were the most important next steps for their organizations. And the standout finding, the standout thing um, from both men and women on how gender equality and progression could be supported and improved related to having a family-friendly company culture. Um, and that embraces um, flexible working hours, support for part-time working, and an overall culture supporting work-life balance rather than the long hours culture that around half, half of respondents had said that their organization still um, had. The next most important finding was around how promotion and progression takes place. Um, both men and women, as we said before, thought that who you know was uh, the most significant barrier affecting promotion chances, um, and that didn't seem to be a gendered issue. But large numbers of women also reported that, in their view, promotion happened through male-dominated networks, and a third also said that they believe that the attitudes of senior managers um, do act as a barrier to women's progression. Um, and clearly, um, this does need to be investigated and tackled where, it's, where it is, is identified in organizations and identified as impacting on fair progression. Um, so, in fact, for both promotion and pay negotiation, many of the issues um, that women perceive as inhibiting them, the sorts of issues that we've talked about, could be tackled um, if organizations had much more structured and transparent processes um, where progression and, and pay awards were much more clearly linked to 
um, clear and objective criteria. And the more that that can be introduced, the more that that can be done within organizations, the more you remove the scope for softer, scope, softer factors um, that we've talked about for attitudes and networking to be the predominant factors influencing pay and progression. Um, and if we're going to support all of that, there's undoubtedly a need for more subtle cultural change. Um, including raising awareness of how unconscious bias might affect diversity through its effect on, on pay and progression outcomes. And we know, again, from the survey results um, that 42% of women and 28% of men thought that action to tackle unconscious bias was an important area, one, one of the key areas needed to um, advance gender equality. So that's what... Um, respondents told us. I'm just going to wrap up now, finally, with my overall conclusions. Um, so, I, you know, based on this survey, I do think there are many, many positive messages to take. It is the case that overall progression opportunities are seen as good. Um, there is some progress on pay transparency and pay inequality. You know, we have to remember that two-thirds of respondents did think that men and women were, were being paid e equally in their work. Um, Nevertheless, um, there does need to be action to tackle the very widespread view that pro promotion in the se sector is determined by who you know, and that for women that is being accentuated by male-dominated networks and unconscious bias. Um, and if the industry is going to make progress in bringing down its overall gender pay gap, it's really only going to happen if women's representation in senior roles increases significantly. That's what all the external research is showing. That's what the TSB's analysis showed. Um, and if we're going to do that, um, as this survey has told us, there needs to be action to increase the number of female role models, to improve talent retention, to support mentoring, um, to implement good flexible working practices and to make flexibility available in senior roles as well, um, and to ensure this transparency in promotion and pay um, that also addresses unconscious bias. Um, so all of those things have got to be priorities in bringing about um, the change that everybody wants to see. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's the end of my um, presentation of the slides, um, so we can now move on to questions. Thanks, Hilary. Um, we received a few interesting questions, so we'll just work ourselves through them. So the first one we received is um, asking, reporting gender pay and signing up to the Charter helps, but in practical terms, what action can firms and individuals take? Okay. Um, well, I think... For firms, um, clearly there needs to be positive action from the top. There needs to be um, role modeling fr from senior leaders. They need to, be pu they need to publicly um, commit to um, doing something differently. Um, so action plans with targets, um, you know, putting across the right tone, holding managers to account for delivering on diversity, appointing diversity managers. Um, and then, you know, really looking at analyzing their processes, looking at, you know, where the pinch points are, how their recruitment um, takes place, whether they can make um, promotion and recruitment more um, objectively based, perhaps having some stages of the process anonymized so that those unconscious biases can't creep in, um, maybe promoting people in batches so that so you get people ready in, in a group to be moved into a particular level rather than um, promoting them um, one by one. Um, for individuals, um, I think, you know, they can... Uh, I think, I think one, one of the opportunities of, of gender pay reporting is that it, it does empower in, individuals within organizations to ask questions. Um, and the Pay Me Too um, campaign that's been started, a cross-party campaign, um, you know, has, has said that, that, that they will be supporting individuals and, and, and groups within their organization to ask whether, um, for instance, equal pay audits have taken place, whether there are effective job evaluations. So there's lots, there's lots of areas where 
um, subtle inequalities might exist that if you had a sort of a, a more systematic look at them through an equal pay audit or um, systematic job evaluation exercises, um, you may well see progress being made. But I, I think, you know, organizations need to be proactive now and, and show leadership. Thanks, Hilary. Um, the second question is, there hasn't been much talk about what men can do to share parenting responsibilities so that women are not not shouldering all the work. What do you think employers can do to make it easier for fathers to play their part? Okay, well, that's, that's, um, I mean, that's very interesting. I think, um, I think there's a lot of evidence now that, that men um, do want to, to play their part, do want to get more involved in, in um, family responsibilities. Um, there might be sometimes a sort of uh, fear for men that that they that, that may create um, a negative response if if, if they, they start trying to ask for, for more flexibility and so on, although I think we're, we're perhaps moving beyond that as well. But I certainly think that organisations... Um, need to, to be very clear about creating a culture that makes it okay for men to be involved, okay for men to, you know, leave early on occasion to pick up children, to, to ask for flexibility, um, you know, and, uh, you know, not to acquiesce in, in um, the long hours culture. So, um, you know, we we need to be family friendly to fathers as well as to mothers, um, and, we, and we need to to have organisations that make it clear that that's okay. I think there there's some specific things um, that employers can look at. I mean, one of one of the um, things that's been around for for a while now is um, shared parental leave, where um, both parents can share parental leave um, rather than it being predominantly maternity leave after the birth of a child. Um, but what we do know is the take-up of shared parental leave by fathers is incredibly low. Um, and one reason for that is that probably um, in most organizations, fathers, when they take um, shared parental leave after they've had their two weeks paternity leave, are only able to claim statutory minimum pay, which I think is about £145 a week. Whereas when mothers go on maternity leave, their employers often give them quite um, significantly enhanced maternity payments for, for quite a long period of time. And that's stacking incentives away from men taking leave because patern there's no enhancement of, of leave for fathers. And I think that, um, you know, so there, there are employers now, including, I think, in financial services, who are looking at that. Um, I'm pretty sure the civil service is looking at it. And looking at how um, how fathers are paid during parental leave, as well as how mothers are paid, in order to equalise that and to and to give an, an, an equal incentive to both men and women to take that. And I think I think that could be really quite transformational if organisations were to take a strategic look at issues like that. Great. We have one last question for today. So, is there has been a lot of media interest around the publication of the company's gender pay gap data? Do you think it will change anything, or is it just a publicity exercise? Um, yeah, again, that's that's another interesting question. Um, I mean, it, the gender pay gap data have been published every year for 20 years or so by the Office for National Statistics. That's the data that I showed you earlier. So, to a certain extent, this isn't this isn't new. But as you say, there's been um, a, a lot of media interest around the new law. Um, on businesses publishing data. And I think the really significant thing is it's not anymore some abstract um, average. This is um, people publishing stuff that relates to their own staff and the makeup of their own business and their own business practices. I do think it, it can have um, a significant effect. Um, only uh, today, I think, or yesterday in The Guardian, um, we're told that um, ministers are going to be demanding gender pay gap action plans from the key sectors that they work with. Um, and, you know, if, if organizations are, are preparing action plans and being asked by ministers for action plans, and as I said earlier, there's a lot of um, political interest from the prime minister and, and other senior um, cabinet ministers, then... Um, you know, organizations are going to have to explain and take action to 
um, to reduce their gender pay gap or to understand it. Um, and, and obviously, they're going to have to report again next year and, and, and every subsequent year. And, and I mean, one really interesting example, actually, it's not financial services, but it's, um, it is really interesting, EasyJet. Um, has got a gender pay gap of 52%. So it's one of the um, worst worst of all the organisations that, that has reported. Um, but when the narrative that they they um, put out with their report, um, they said that, um, that their pay rates are negotiated by unions and men and women in the same roles are paid the same. But the problem is that just about all of their pilots are male, 6%, I think, and um, and their cabin staff are mostly female, and that's what's given them this 52% pay gap. Um, but because of gender pay gap reporting, they they thought about that, and they've announced um, their Amy Johnson initiative, uh, where they've got a program now to, to set a target to recruit um, 20% of their pilots as female by 2020. So that's an example of where... They weren't doing anything illegal, but they were embarrassed by their gender pay gap, um, and they've now um, publicly committed to doing something about it. And I, and, and I do think that, um, you know, it comes down to good business practice, but it also comes down to image. Companies don't want to be seen negatively by their customers or by potential recruits as somewhere that's not addressing gender diversity and doesn't, don't, you know, somewhere that's not. Um, concerned about gender pay gaps, so I, th I think I think those kinds of pressures. I, you know, I'm 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 optimistic. Thank you, Hilary. I think this brings us to the end of our webcast. Therefore, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Hilary for providing such an insightful webcast, and of course to our listeners as well. For members of the Charter Banker Institute, today's webcast can be recorded as part of your ongoing CPD. Please remember to record this via the logbook in the members area of the website. The slide pack will be available to all listeners after today's presentation. We would also welcome your feedback. Once again, we would like to thank you for listening. Thanks very much. <laughs>